is uh, Deborah Fisher. I'm the executive director of A Blade of Grass. I want to welcome everybody and thank everybody for coming out. A Blade of Grass is the first funding nonprofit that's dedicated solely to nurturing socially engaged art. And that means that we fund artists and collectives like yourselves who are working directly with communities in ways that are relevant to everyday life to at ambitious scale to enact social change. We also create programs and web content uh, like tonight that uh, explores the challenges and opportunities of socially engaged art. Tonight is uh, our fellowship workshop and we're really specifically interested in making sure that we don't waste artists' time and that we make sure that we really prepare artists really well for applying for this fellowship. So what we want to do tonight is, is go through uh, in detail two things, right, that are really, really crucial. The first thing is uh, fit. You know, a blade of grass is, is working with a very, very specific state. And the blade of grass fellowship for socially engaged art is uh, narrower in terms of its criteria than many, many opportunities for contemporary artists. So that means that a lot of people who are doing really, really amazing work are not going to have a good fit with our specific criteria. So we're going to go into that a little bit and make sure that there's an alignment between your project and our criteria. Uh, the other thing that we learned last year when we did our first fellowship open call is that writing about social practice is uniquely difficult. Uh, you have to balance a lot of different things while at the same time being very realistic about the people that you're working with in a concrete way, in a concrete community that already exists. What we found is that some people were very, very good at focusing on, on the nuts and bolts part, you know, to the exclusion of really defining the artistic vision. Or the opposite, you know, uh, people, some people were so good at writing about um, why it was an art project that we didn't really feel like they were going to get it done, you know? So, so what, <laughs> you know, and, and it's hard, and it's hard to write about your own projects too, you know, so one of the things that we're going to be focusing on today is, is really um, a couple of really excellent examples of letters of interest that wound up being fellowship projects. And we're going to talk about why they were excellent together. So uh, without further ado, tonight's format, we're going to start with a great example. Pablo Helguera, one of our fellows uh, from this first year, uh, is going to be doing a great presentation about his project. Uh, followed by a question and answer session that's really going to be aimed at this notion of fit. Uh, Elizabeth Brady, uh, our programs director, is going to come stand right here. We're going to talk about uh, what the criteria are uh, for the fellowship specifically and answer your questions. Then we're going to break up into two big groups. Uh, there will be moving of chairs. We'll <laughs> divide up the room equally, you know, and everything. It's going to be chaos. Then we'll settle in these two groups, and um, and we're going. And what we're going to do is we're going to really look in detail at two specific examples of letters of interests that uh, letters of interest from projects that became fellowship projects this year, last year, and we're going to go over um, you know some ideas about why they're excellent together. And we're going to have a conversation about that. That's going to be all about just writing, how to write. Um, then, the last thing is we're trying something new this year where we're going to try to get a buddy system together. Sometimes it's some of the hardest writing, uh, the hardest thing about writing is that when you're writing about your own project, it's really difficult to get uh, a fresh set of eyes on it. So anybody who wants to sign up to be a part of a, a working group, right, we will introduce groups of three or four to one another, right? And, that's all we're doing, making an introduction to having a writing buddy. So that's the format. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce Pablo Helguera. We're very excited to have him here tonight. Uh, Pablo's work takes a pedagogic approach to exploring the relationship between art and language, as well as the social dynamics of contemporary art in our daily lives. His School of Pan American Unrest is a nomadic think tank that facilitates discussions, screenings, performances, and partnerships. It has been touring for over a decade, crossing 20,000 miles through 40 US states. In addition to his art and music practice, Helgera is currently the director of adult and academic programs at MoMA, and he was a mean Edgar Allan Poe for Halloween. Uh, <laughs> his Ablaine of Grass Fellowship, no seriously, 
Okay. <laughs> um, the Zablada Grass Fellowship will support the installation of uh, Libreria Donceles, a nonprofit itinerant bookstore of 20,000 used Spanish language books and accompanying programming in Brooklyn this spring, uh, this spring of 2015. Thank you, Pablo. Thanks, Laura. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, and uh, Blade of Grass is a very special and dear place to me and to many of us who have been involved in social practice uh, for several years. Um, uh, I feel that for those of us who have been interested in this kind of work, uh, it's been a long wait to actually see institutions recognize this kind of work. And still to this day, uh, I feel that a lot of uh, major art institutions and the art world in general is still is trying to is still struggling to grasp what uh, this kind of art is about, and I think that's a really interesting moment to be making it because it's a moment where uh, we are still trying to figure it out on our own, and yet I think that the the, the collective feeling and the collective um, sentiment that uh, fuels this kind of work. Is very clear, you know. I think we are looking for art that really helps uh, make a difference in society. Uh, we're looking for art that uh, that really engages with people in ways that go beyond the traditional conventions or what has become the traditional conventions of art making and art exhibiting. And ultimately, that we are trying to find, I believe, a kind of humanity. And, and kind of connection that uh, sometimes we feel it's lost. Uh, so it's, I think, to me, like a like a search for a real purpose uh, of art making and the, for the place of art in the world. So it, to me, this is like a really important thing. It is not just a, a discipline. It's just not a genre. It's not just about, oh, I make social practice as opposed to I make video, or I make social practice as opposed to I do uh, dance. It's, to me, uh, social practice is more than just a medium, it's more than just a discipline. It's an entire attitude and philosophy uh, about art making and about your place in the world. So, what I, what I will do very quickly, uh, will just kind of give you a little sense of uh, where I come from, and uh, uh, I guess aesthetically and, and uh, personally, and, and why I do the kind of work that I do. Uh, some people know me for this book that I wrote, uh, Education for Socially Engaged Art, which was a, uh, an attempt around four years ago to try to kind of make sense of uh, how, how is it that we can learn how to make this kind of work in the field when we are out there in the, in the ground. It's, it's, this is meant to be not a theoretical uh, book that uh, I think of which I think there's many right now. Um, but more kind of like hands-on manual, a handbook that uh, had as, a, uh, as its purpose to really think of social practice as uh, something that responds to a variety of vehicles, conversation, collaboration, documentation, and how do you really uh, go about um, managing them. Um, one thing that I, that I will say is that, uh, and I think one of the myths that I believe exist about social practice or, or social media chat is that it's, that it's not about uh, that is disconnected to the tradition of art history or of art making. And I, I pretty much believe the contrary. I believe that this is very much in dialogue with art history and with the history of contemporary art and 20th century art. And uh, in many cases, it results in things that uh, might appear to be more conventional artworks, but they're not. Um, uh, so this is just an example of one piece that I, that I did um, last year. And uh, in a way, it was dedicated to my daughter. Um, I asked 50 individuals to do a project with me. Uh, it's a game that lasts 50 years. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a, it's a game that, that, that has 50 people involved and it lasts for the rest of our lives. Um, it's, it's a game played by 50 participants uh, that never get stopped playing. Uh, and everybody received 16 envelopes. Um, one of them was opened on the, day, the very first day of the, of the game. The second, you know, the second, two days later, the third, four days later, it's 8, 16, 32, 64, and so forth. So as the time goes by, the distance between envelopes uh, gets, this gets uh, doubled to the point that uh, months, years, decades start going by between the distance of envelopes. So it's a, 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 a collaborative experience uh, built on trust 
uh, and, uh, and the last envelope will be opened in 2097, mm -hmm. uh, a year that unfortunately, I sorry, say most of us won't be around. Yeah. And I definitely won't be around. My, my daughter, is, she's going to be in her 90s when she actually uh, opens that envelope. Yeah. <clears throat> and, um, and, um, but to me, it's really about questioning what's really the extent of the art, the art experience, what's really the, the, the point, what, what is really that connects us, you know, what, what, I mean, what is the role of an artwork in connecting us uh, uh, individually, and for whom is that work made for, and whether the, the, the persons that you're engaging with is a complete stranger or, or someone who's very close to you, you know, what can the artwork do to really uh, facilitate that? that dialogue, that understanding, and create perhaps a bond mm -hmm. that might not naturally exist between individuals. Um, to me, the, the, this question has always played, whether it's at a very personal, intimate level, like the, like the, the piece I previously mentioned, to, to more kind of romantic and idealistic gestures, like uh, the, what the Pan American project was, which was to drive 20,000 miles from <coughs> Anchorage to Tierra del Fuego asking people, what, what if we all were a single country? What if there was no borders between Alaska and Chile, and we all were a single country named Pan America? Um, uh, it, it was a work, it's a work that was, uh, a project that was stemmed from um, the, the awareness that borders and, and national and religious differences are basically what creates a great deal of the, the evil in this world and, uh, and the hatred in this world. So it was it was a work that tried to, to reflect on that, and uh, and when I was when I was doing this project, uh, when I started this project in 2003, there were no words for social practice or social art. Uh, there were the words of like uh, I suppose relational aesthetics, but to me relational aesthetics didn't really mean much. To me, it meant kind of like a really empty type of participation that you did in a gallery, and that participating was to touch something or to just like eat something. And to me, participation needed to go beyond that. It really meant to, to really touch somebody and be and let yourself be touched by someone, which is one thing that, you, that we tend to forget. So this rationale has informed a lot of the things that I have done. Um, this project was called Le Club de Protesta, uh, the protest club. It was working with low-income residents in New York City uh, and professional musicians to, to do a collective uh, protest music uh, uh, concerts, uh, which happened at the High Line uh, here, and uh, tried to to see how we could bridge the gap between people who had a lot to say but did not have the the artistic uh, background to say it, and people who had the artistic background but necessarily did not have a message to come. Well, I mean, they have messages to convey, but they 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 came from a very different uh, place. And how can a true collaboration between uh, <coughs> Uh, between individuals can take place uh, brokered by, by art. Uh, or creating a radio station in the city of Bologna, uh, working with local artists uh, to basically create a structure under which people can uh, become creative themselves. Uh, my job in this particular uh, project was to simply create this radio station and, and, uh, and work with, um, uh, with others to, to um, start a radio production school uh, with uh, younger artists to actually create their own programming. And then kind of uh, help uh, aid the situation in a city like Bologna that had no, had a scarcity of art spaces where artists, uh, young artists could actually present their work. Um, and, um, and so it goes back and forth, small and big. Uh, I have done uh, tarot reading, reading parlors, I have done singing telegram shows, I have done um, basically uh, uh, anything you can possibly imagine in terms of like a one-to-one -one relationships. Um, it always boils down to, 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 that, to the individual relationship. And the, the last project that I recently did, which, is, uh, which happened two weeks ago, it was a year-long project where um, I, um, I did a performance at, at the Brooklyn Academy of Music at BAM, and, uh, and I invited the audience a year before. Uh, and anybody could sign up to, to come to the, to the, to the performance. And as soon as they signed up, I would start a, an individual correspondence with that person. Uh, it was called the Parallel Conference, uh, in which everyone would receive every month a, a, a very specialized uh, individual letter from me telling them a story, usually a parable about art. This went on for a year. 
basically regular old-fashioned correspondence of letters, uh, which you know we don't receive anymore these days. Uh, each letter uh, was tailored to that person, uh, and as much as I knew about that person, or that, as much as that person let me know about, about themselves, uh, we kind of created this relationship. And the event was like this mysterious event that nobody knew what was going to happen. Everybody was asked to, to address formally. Uh, they showed up, we had removed all the, the chairs of the, of the theater, and we had turned it into a gala uh, with uh, what we called hosts, you know, that were, will greet you and will know everything about you, will have memorized your bio, you know, would, would know which letters you had received, and then we'll broker a conversation amongst the participants about the correspondence that, we, that they had experienced over the whole year. Um, and uh, it, so it was a way to also connect with people at levels that we normally don't connect with anymore, maybe uh, by email and, and texting, uh, that somehow the, uh, the, the physicality of the, of the letter uh, to me is important. And, and they, 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 I think it's very important for a public or for an audience to, 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 to sense how much you actually care for them. That you, don't, you as an artist, you don't see them as kind of part of this mass of people or, or this kind of a, uh, amorphous uh, a public. But that that, it, that you're actually acknowledging them as individual as individuals, yeah. and um, this is kind of um, related to the project that I proposed to to Blade of Brass, uh, yeah, around a year ago. Um, and um, basically, I I am a big bookstore fan. You know, I love books, the actual books, the actual thing, the physical thing, whole book. Um, I am also a big used bookstore. And I, like, I, every book, every bookstore that you know, I find, I immediately I'm there and I'm trying to find weird books. You know, fascinated with that stuff. And it's been very painful to me to see that uh, bookstores are disappearing. Uh, not not just uh, used bookstores, but bookstores in general. We're living in a you know in a strange, uh, in a fascinating area, many levels. You know, the, where uh, everything seems faster and, and more immediate, but at the same time we're losing very quickly uh, a sensorial. Uh, uh, the sensorial experience of many things. And to me, the, the, the bookstore itself uh, uh, is a very important uh, cultural uh, construct that, uh, especially the used bookstore, it's, it's this place where that you walk into when not necessarily knowing what you want. It's, it's that experience of, uh, of being the hunter-gatherer, perhaps, of, of ancient times, where you actually find something uh, or it finds you. So it's very different than actually just, you know, being on, getting online and just getting a book. Uh, and uh, there's other elements to it. I'm from Mexico City, uh, where downtown, if you've ever been there, uh, which is an incredible uh, city, uh, there's a street called Moncelles. And uh, in, in downtown Mexico City, there's a street for everything. You want to buy like uh, underwear, there's a street for underwear, there's a street for electronics, there's a street for phones, a uh, street for wedding cakes, and there's a street for used books, which is Moncelles. And, uh, and those bookstores are unbelievable. There are just like mountains and mountains of books, usually almost free. You know, that will, that will cost that will cost you ten cents per book or so. Um, and um, and I I had this kind of uh, dream of trying to like start a, a bookstore in New York City in Spanish. Um, uh, why? Because um, uh, well, this observation that I had that in, in New York City there's eight million people, uh, two million of which speak Spanish. And yet, uh, there's practically no Spanish bookstores in New York City. There's no bookstore in Manhattan uh, or exclusively dedicated to, to Spanish-speaking uh, books in all of New York. Right? Uh, there's, there's books, there's an academic bookstore, perhaps, uh, in Queens that's very actually hard to get to. Um, and, um, and the other thing is that the kind of bookstores that you find uh, that sell books, so if you go to Barnes & Noble, you'll find translations of Stephen King, uh, New Age novels, and. Uh, and, and that's about it, many cookbooks and, and how to learn Spanish, but not really other uh, things. Uh, there was a case of a poet, Jose Juan Taurada, who in the 1920s started a bookstore, which was a colossal failure, you know, Libreria de los Latinos, and there he is, his beautiful bookstore. He failed, and I thought, well, why not just fail, like him at least? You know? um, so what I did is I went to Mexico City, and I started offering um, some artwork of mine in exchange of books, and it started very small. I mean, I had, at the beginning, I had maybe like a box of books. And I thought, well, I don't think I can do a bookstore with a box. Um, um, and then um, I managed to get uh, a paper to actually write a story about this in Mexico City. And I think about, one thing about Mexico City is that everybody has 
lived in many years in their houses with it. So, so they accumulate a lot of uh, books. And uh, so before I knew it, I started getting lots of people bringing me books of every kind, and every kind of people from every, every walk of life, you know, uh, uh, teachers and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, doctors and uh, artists and writers and journalists and children bringing their children's books. Um, there was something really exciting for people that were participating in this project that felt that were aid, helping to, to um, support a population in New York City that is usually and in the U.S., it is completely abandoned by both countries, which is the immigrant, you know, that, that uh, has no uh, real support or, or even human acknowledgement about their presence here. And, and uh, in Mexico, this is like a very painful thing that nobody knows what to do about it. And this, this project, I think, gave them an opportunity to, um, to, to, to contribute. And some people contributed with unbelievable amounts of books. And so within three weeks, we had 25,000 books. Uh, in the house of some parents of a friend who don't like me very much. <laughs> uh, it really kind of got out of control. And, um, but we, um, we, then we then had to fundraise to actually bring the books to, uh, to, to New York. And uh, it, it first opened in the gallery. Uh, we turned the entire Chelsea Gallery to the bookstore. Uh, so there, there was now as Libreria Roselis. And that was last fall. And, um, what was important about the Gradiano Celes is that not only that, it had 60 different categories of books. You had anatomy, you had, uh, um, you had uh, uh, law, and, uh, and theater, and horror, and biography. And I invented my own categories, categories like, that, like bad books, uh, corny books, etc. <laughs> um, but, but what was important is that to me, it was a third place. It was a place where people could come in, hang out, and just interact. And uh, the bookstore became almost a, a pretext for doing these things called tertulias, which were kind of uh, cultural gatherings with people, uh, where we invited uh, poets and uh, musicians and uh, young writers to, to present. Basically, it became an open forum for people to, to, um, <clears throat> to present their work and to, and to, and to find books and to, and to make a, a personal connection with the book. Which, by the way, each book has an ex libris with the name of the person who gave it, which is meant to connect them with the original owner. So then, what happened is like I was I was left with twenty five thousand books and all these shelves, and, and then the gallery wanted me out of there, and uh, because the show was over technically, uh, so I had to figure out how I was going to put this stuff. And um, what ended up happening is like I I started traveling the project. Uh, it first went to Phoenix in Arizona where it actually existed for six months in a storefront um, and uh, became the only Spanish bookstore in Phoenix. And if you have followed politics uh, in Arizona, you will know that Arizona is ground zero for anti-immigration sentiment. So it was a really important place to actually um, be there and, uh, and support uh, local organizations that, that were uh, supporting Latino rights and, uh, and uh, immigration rights. Uh, so it became kind of like this hub of activity for six months for a huge variety of dozens of different organizations that, that came there. Currently, uh, Los Celes is in San Francisco in the Mission District, um, where it, it's in a, in a smaller location, uh, but, but also uh, serving another uh, in interesting mission to me, that, which is that in the Mission District, which used to be Latino, uh, now it has mostly been gentrified. And, uh, it was kind of like a claiming a state back uh, to, the, to its old community. Um, and so basically the project in, um, uh, that the grant will, will cover the public labor press is to bring back the bookstore to New York. And the proposal was to, to bring it back to my neighborhood, which is in Red Hook in Brooklyn, and uh, which is a, a, a place that, uh, as you know, was hit hard by, by Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and also it has a strong Latino population, and yet uh, it still lacks a lot of ser cultural services, and there's not a lot of cultural organizations in smaller parts of New York. Uh, so the idea is to exist there and become kind of like this, uh, again, this center where uh, we, we establish this dialogue and of the awareness of the Spanish language. And uh, just, just to conclude by saying that to me this is not just about doing something for those who speak Spanish, but really um, to, have a, to be a meeting point of, of cultural exchange. And, uh, and this uh, bookstore really serves um, people who speak every language. Uh, it's really a place for dialogue and, uh, and a place for exchange. Questions? 
Uh, I have a question about the geographical location in terms of being an artist, what you're doing uh, in terms of socially engaged art. You are from Mexico. I guess you live in New York and you're making work here, but it relates back to where you're from. And um, also this kind of art where you um, projecting the ideas for the future that relates back to other artists. How does it relate back to the geographical relationship to your work? I guess what I would say is that art to me is both highly local and at the same time, you know, it's, it's it can be everywhere. You know, uh, and I think when you work in this way, I remember when I went to Italy you know, and I was doing this project in Bologna, uh, some of the older artists that saw me doing this project were very skeptical of me because I wasn't from there. And they told me like, why are you here? Uh, like, you will never understand our reality. This is such a complex place and it's so complicated. And, like, only an, uh, only an Italian artist from Bologna could make a piece about Bologna. You know? <laughs> and um, which made me really think about, you know, well, the reality is like, it's not that we're Martians, you know. I mean, we're all humans. We're men and women, you know, like everywhere in between, you know. <laughs> and uh, we love, we hate, you know, we, we have sex, we, we all do all these things, you know. So, in the end, it's an acknowledgement of humanity, which really is everywhere. Uh, so, on, on the one hand, I think, uh, as, to me, a successful piece has to have that acknowledgement, but at some time, it has to have an acknowledgement of the, of the local. You know, like this is this is where we are, and this is why it's important to do it here. I wanted to ask you if it's a bookstore selling books or lending books, because it's not clear. And second, uh, how do you do the outreach to those communities that you talk about that they don't get uh, access to resources, all the Latino communities, apart from being in a place? The, um, so it's a bookstore, so it sells books. So it's confusing because libreria in Spanish sounds like library, but libreria in Spanish actually means bookstore. So uh, we sell books, but the books is pay what you wish. Uh, and uh, it's one book per customer per visit, so that somebody doesn't come and buy our books for a dollar. You know, so, uh, so we try to maintain the, the, the emphasis on that like, each book is important, you know, but at the same time, it's completely accessible. You can show up with a penny and then just get the best book of the, of the store. You know? And in terms of, uh, of relation with uh, the community, it, it tends to become a very organic process. And it uh, basically, I, I reach out to local organizations telling them about what's happening. I reach out to individuals, and, uh, and it spreads you know, through over the months. You know? And uh, what happened, for example, with Phoenix is I met with around 10 or 15 organizations to let them know about the project. And they brought their own constituents. So that became kind of like a working group of people that already kind of service and core for, for reaching out to other people. So it, it kind of became in concentric circles, so which by the time we were finishing the project, we had reached out to a lot of people uh, from those concentric circles. Great. OK, so thank you very much, Pablo. Thank you. Thank yes. you very much. here, a lot of familiar faces and a lot of new faces, so it's a good mix. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our um, selection criteria for the fellowship, which I realize sounds a little dull, um, but I'm going to make it as exciting as possible. Um, the reason I want to go over this material with you um, is to clarify a few things. We get some questions about it, so I want to, um, to do my best to sort of um, illuminate the criteria for you. And I also want to talk a little bit about the idea of fit. Um, there are so many wonderful projects in the world, and we cannot fund them all, right? Um, you know, we have a um, wonderful, wonderful board, and incredible generosity has come our way, but we cannot fund thousands and thousands of artists. And so what we've done is we've put together criteria that are in line with our mission. And we're looking for um, the artists who are, you know, who are doing projects that are really the, the very best fit. And so you might be doing an incredible project, but if you feel like you're having to shoehorn that project into our criteria, it's probably not going to advance to the final round. 
And the reason for that is that the selection committee, because we do get a lot of applications, they need to, um, to interpret our criteria very narrowly. And so I want to make sure that um, the, the criteria are clear so that you don't go to a lot of work if your project just isn't quite the right match, right? Um, the other thing I want to talk about in terms of fit is that Ablative Brass really sees um, the work that we do as a partnership with the artists. Um, we're looking for partners in telling the story of what community engaged art looks like. Um, and so a question that you might want to ask yourself in thinking about the criteria is, is your project uh, a good uh, match for our mission? Are you a good partner in, in putting forward that mission? Um, and don't be afraid to take a look at the mission statement on our website. Uh, and the reason I, I bring up partnership is that uh, as an organization, we want to not only support artists, which is our primary mission, but we also want to be able to expand the, um, expand the audience for this kind of work. We want to be able to educate people about this kind of work, and we want to be able to accrue more resources to this kind of work. And so we're not only looking for the best projects. There are lots of best projects, right? Um, there are lots, there's lots of brilliant work being done in this area. Um, but we're looking for projects that help us tell that story, that help us to, help us to, um, to illuminate our mission. All right? um, and so um, I'm going to go through these um, really quickly, and I'll take a few questions afterward. But I'm going to ask that you please uh, restrict your questions to general questions about the criteria and not at this time ask specific questions about your own project because we have about 100 people in the room and we don't have time to talk about everybody's project and so it wouldn't be fair, right? If you have specific questions that don't get answered through the course of the evening, please shoot me an email at info at ablativegrass.org. I'd be delighted to answer um, individual questions there. But, but in, the, in the context of this evening, we just don't have time for that. So I'm going to ask you to just um, try to, to hold back a little bit. I know it's um, so here are our selection criteria. You're actually looking at our website right now. So this is exactly what you find if you go online. And we ask the people who review um, the, the uh, letters of interest to focus on four main criteria. Uh, artistic excellence, the project's capacity to enact social change, the project's viability in everyday life, and the fit with our resources. Um, so let's just really quickly kind of breeze through these. I know most of you probably already looked at them. Um, does the artist have a strong track record? I want to make it clear that we're not looking necessarily for artists who have had 15 shows at MoMA, okay? That's not, that's not what we mean by a strong track record. What we mean is that you have demonstrated that you're working as a, a professional artist, that you, you've done work in this area, okay? We're just, we're looking for people who are professional artists. Um, and so that can mean a lot of different things. Is the project ambitious? Again, this is about the scale of your project. Lots and lots of things can be ambitious at different scales, okay? Um, and so it doesn't have to be a project that's gonna reach 10,000 people and have, you know, reviews all over the place in the, the art press. That's not what we mean by that, okay? Um, ambitious within the context of, of your worldview, uh, whatever that means for your project. Is it aesthetically compelling? Uh, some of these projects sometimes can look a little bit like, um, you know, straight education or um, straight um, advocacy, something like that. And so we're looking for projects that have that vision piece, right? Because that's why you're doing it in an art context and not in a community organizing context or whatever else might be appropriate for, for your subject area. Can it act as a leading example in the field? Fairly self-evident, right? Um, the project's capacity to enact social change. Does it approach a specific issue in a new way or otherwise offer opportunity for innovation? If it's Something that's been done a hundred times before, what are you doing that's different? Why, why is it that your project is going to be the exciting one that is doing 
storytelling about uh, a specific community or, or whatever it is, right? Um, does it enact as opposed to represent social change? This is a tricky one, and it's one that, um, that really comes up a lot. Uh, when we say represent social change, there's a lot of political art out there, right? You go to gallery shows, museum shows, and you see actually really, really terrific art that's talking about political issues. That's great. We, as a staff, love a lot of that art. It's actually not what we fund. What we fund is art that is specifically engaging with communities to directly participate in a change-making process rather than sort of at one remove educating people about it. Okay? So there's, there's sort of a, a difference there. And that's why we focus on, um, on process rather than product. It's why we don't fund exhibitions. Okay, we're really focused on that, that engagement piece. Uh, if the project is ongoing, uh, does this proposal, your proposal, represent meaningful growth in the project? A lot of these things happen over years, sometimes over a couple of years, sometimes over 10, 15, 20, 30 years, right? Um, and so what is it about this moment that's important for your project? That's all that we have. And then here's your aesthetic question again. You started to get a theme here. Um, is the project aesthetically or formally innovative? What are you bringing to the table? Doesn't mean it has to be something that's coming completely out of nowhere, right? But what is it about your project that makes it interesting as an art project? Um, the viability in everyday life. Does it attract the interest of non-artist stakeholders? In other words, um, are people who aren't artists or art historians or curators going to be interested in it in, in some way? Um, does it meaningfully engage a community or communities? Um, if it doesn't, not a good fit for us. Uh, is it legitimately helpful? That's the social change piece. Uh, is its language externally focused? What we mean by that is a lot of times when you're coming up with a concept for a project. It's you or you and a few collaborators kind of working together in, in a small unit. And it's really easy to come up with kind of your own jargon and your own shorthand for talking about what it is you're doing. That's great and it works well and it saves time and you know what you're talking about. But you need to make sure that when you write this letter of interest that people who have no idea what you're doing are also going to understand what you're talking about. And remember, on our selection committees, there's always a non-artist, non-art historian, non-art educator, community organizer. Um, and we're really interested in that audience beyond just the, the narrow art world audience. Um, and so be sure that, that what you're writing is transparent. Avoid jargon, you know, some of those, those basic things. Um, is it meaningful in the absence of a contemporary art context or an initiated audience? Again, that's sort of, that's the looking outside the art world thing, right? Um, is it feasible? <laughs> Might sound kind of funny, but some of these projects sound so wildly ambitious that we need to, you need to kind of help us understand how it's going to happen just a little bit. Uh, because the selection committee will, uh, will take a look at that. They don't need to know every detail of how you're going to make it happen. Heck, most of these things, evolve as you're doing them and they're going to change from the moment that you write your letter of interest to the, the moment that you're even beginning your work with us. Right? Um, but you have to, to, to give us some indication of how it's going to happen. Uh, fit with resources. So that's, that's your fit um, with us. Okay? This is a fellowship, not a grant. And we use that, that language very, very carefully and self-consciously. What this is is an opportunity to interface with seven other artists who are working in this area. It includes uh, quarterly meetings. It includes a program of self-assessment. Um, it's, not, it's not just about your project. It's, it's about being part of a community that we're forming as well as the broader community that you're working with, wherever that might be or whoever that might be. Um, so fit with resources is, is actually a big deal to us. Um, are, are, you an, are you an independent artist? You're not an organization, in other words, because what we find are individual artists or artist collectives. Collectives are totally fine, just not boards. 
Um, will you and or the project particularly benefit from a supportive cohort of other artists working on similar projects um, or problems? And will you benefit from occasional institutional assistance, such as contacts or consultation? Now, third one is about how we can help you. If you're so far along that we can't possibly help you, then you may not be the best candidate either. Um, and so we're looking for people where we can really make a difference in their projects, right? people who we can really help. Uh, will the project benefit from the artist's self-guided, or guided, excuse me, self-reflection, reciprocal peer evaluation, and study by an outside evaluator? Assessment is a part of the package of the fellowship. And so um, that assessment, from our perspective, isn't, isn't a judgmental kind of assessment. It's actually uh, an opportunity for sort of growth and learning within your own process. And um, we are looking for people who are interested in participating actively in that kind of process. Um, and is the project something that can benefit from having its story told through an external voice? Documentation is another part of the fellowship. Um, we make many documentaries of each project. And so if your, your project um, is something that is impossible in that way, and believe me, we have some very, very creative videographers. So don't, don't worry if, it, if it's hard to see, we can, we can work with telling the story of it. But if it's something where documentation is thoroughly forbidden, you can't imagine how anybody could possibly do it, again, might not be the best fit for resources. Specifically because what we're trying to do is tell the story of this kind of work for a broader audience. So at this time, that's not a good fit for us. Uh, and I also want to take a, just a really fast look at the top reasons um, projects were not chosen uh, because I really want to be sure that nobody is going to write a letter of interest if they don't have a fighting chance. I don't want you guys to go to that work um, if it's something that's just, just not going to be a good match, that your project is great but it's just not quite the right fit. Uh, so the project wasn't innovative. Uh, that came up a fair number of times. The project was not aesthetically compelling. Um, the relationship to the community was poorly defined or overly prescriptive, by which we mean um, come make my art with me, as opposed to let's make art together. Um, the proposal added a small community engagement component to a static public art proposal, rather than a developed project for participation of the community, kind of a different way of saying the same thing. Um, the project completed access to contemporary art and social change. Um, come see contemporary art is not socially engaged art of the sort that we're talking about. It's definitely an engagement, but it's not the one we're talking about. Um, the project proposed to represent a community without meaningfully engaging it. Uh, or the project had an impact exclusive to or primarily in the service of the initiated contemporary art dialogue, by which we mean everybody sitting in this room, people who are already a part of the conversation, right? and lots of other people too, in academia, in galleries, in museums. Uh, so do, do you all have questions about uh, the criteria, things that are unclear, general questions? Yeah. Uh, so is this fellowship compatible with other grants that we are applying for, or? or Sure, you can apply for as many things as you want. We anticipate that most of these projects cost more than $20,000. Okay. Yeah, you bet. What about doing uh, projects not in the U.S.? Absolutely okay. Um, the, the trick is you have to be somebody who may legally work in the U.S., and that's because of our IRS status. Um, and so that's all we're legally permitted to, to do. I was just wondering if you could clarify the difference between an arts collective and an organization. Sure. Um, when we, we think about um, uh, an arts collective, we think of a group of individuals working together. When we think of an organization, we think of um, either somebody who has 501c3 status, automatically disqualified, um, or um, somebody who, who's, or, whose group takes on many of the aspects of an organization. For example, you might have an advisory board, you might have uh, specific job titles, like a director, um, 
a development person, you know, some of that. So you're sort of in, on the path to becoming an org, basically. And some of those um, are not technically 501c3s. They're maybe fiscally sponsored or they have other, um, you know, legal statuses. But anything that, that's an org. And the reason for that is that we feel like those are people who are already building infrastructure on their own. Um, and what we're trying to do is help people who are kind of free-floating without the infrastructure. In regards to um, having a project that's aesthetically viable, um, in the LOI, I believe it said it's about 500 words. Mm -hmm. So how much um, of that space would you allot to describing your work aesthetically or visually as opposed to talking about the... Well, it's a little tricky. We are going to uh, hand out kind of a, a set of guidelines, like a worksheet almost, for, for LOIs. And that's letters of interest for anybody who doesn't catch the jargon. Um, but uh, basically, you're only going to have a small amount of space to really address any of the questions. And it's going to have to be really tight. Um, and so it's probably only a couple of lines, you know. Um, it's not like an artist statement. You know, it's not like, um, you know, uh, the sort of thing that you might do as like an updated version of what you do for an MFA program or something where you're talking really about your vision and the motivation for your work and all that. Too much, right, for this particular thing. It should be sort of your vision for the project. If an artist is working with a couple of organizations in order to help support their outreach and you know, the infrastructure that they don't have, it's so okay. totally fine. Um, most, most of you at some point will have partner organizations. Would it be fair to ask you, since you're asking us about our community, about your community that you're drawing economic resources from, and secondly, how you structure your organization around? ethics and politics. So a blade of grass was founded in 2011 with a seed gift from uh, Shelley uh, Rubin, right? So right now we are working, we are working with that seed gift. We have help with charity status, we actively fundraise, we look for a wide variety of grants. And from our perspective, one of the most interesting things about this work is that it's a, uh, it's a really interesting evolution beyond, say, uh, institutional critique, right? It's uh, art, the artists that we're supporting are actively engaging with power structures. They're not uh, critiquing power, they're wielding it. They're becoming their own institutions. They're shutting, shutting down a prison. They're working actively with uh, corporations, right? So one of the things that we want to do is make sure that everything that we are doing, we can't always succeed at this because we're valuable and human, right? But one of the things that we're really organized around is the idea that we, interrogate our own power and, and make sure that we are being partners to the greatest degree possible. We think a lot about how power dynamics work in the office. And we try really actively to make sure that we are asking questions about the sort of thing that we're really engaging in an active dialogue with the artists that we support. Something very interesting that you mentioned before is about the building of, of structure for the artists. Like sometimes when, when one applies to a grant and you get it, you just get it and then you do your work by your own. But like collaboration process that happens with a blade of grass and that infrastructure, that kind of guidance structure, collaboration process that happens with you, like as you mentioned, like those documentaries or uh, could you expand a little bit in that process? It's actually fascinating. Sure. Um, the fellowship is set up to provide specific services. So one of those services is documentation. This is the kind of uh, art which Deb has famously said always looks like a bunch of people you don't know doing something you don't understand. It's the best way of talking about it. Like the pictures are terrible, right? Um, and so you need something else. And when you're in the middle of this kind of work, it's so demanding and so challenging that it's really hard to, to be your own documentarian. It's incredibly difficult to do the work you do and document it at the same time. It's almost a, like an oxymoron. And so one of the things that, that we feel is very valuable is to have these stories told. Because otherwise, how are people going to understand it unless they're inside of it, right? So that's, that's one thing. Um, these, the question of assessment is a broad one, and we approach it in a number of different ways. And so I'll sort of go from like the outside in, if that's okay. So we, we have um, an outside evaluator who uh, engages in kind of an ethnographic approach. 
where um, they talk to the artists, they talk to other project stakeholders, maybe partner organizations, it might be people in uh, local government, it might be people um, who are community organizers, whoever's engaged with the project to try to get a multiplicity of perspectives on what's happening inside the project. Because a lot of people are, you know, sort of understandably hesitant to talk about the things that maybe aren't working. Um, they don't want to talk to the artist who's come into their community and who's now a friend and say, you know what, when you tried that, ooh, really, a stinker's an idea. You know, they don't want to say that. Um, and so it's a way of, of seeing through the relationships to get at ways of improving the projects. Again, this is not about taking a judgmental position um, from, from our perspective. It's about enriching the project and giving the artist tools to work with to, to continue to improve what they're doing. Um, we also have uh, an orientation session that's two days and four quarterly meetings, which are based around something called collaborative action research. The orientation would give you a few tools in your tool toolbox to work with, um, different strategies of working with communities. We know most of you are incredibly experienced with this. Don't worry, we're not dumbing this down. <laughs> um, and um, then these quarterly meetings, um, this collaborative action research idea is something that actually comes from a pedagogical perspective. And it was designed to help uh, classroom teachers work through issues that they were experiencing in their schools and were experiencing them in isolation. It was them in the class, kind of like I'm you know, standing here talking to you. But if you can get them to talk across um, platforms, they're really dealing with a lot of the same kinds of issues and they can come up with creative solutions together that are more generalized. And collaborative action research is a, a technique for achieving that. The, uh, the uh, author's name is Richard Sager, S-A-G-O-R, in case you're interested in looking it up. Um, so we do that in the quarterly meetings and, and so far I've gotten excellent feedback about that. Um, we also encourage artists in their um, interim and final reports to engage not in a story of how they hit the milestones of the project. You know, I said I was going to, you know, go uh, create a mobile beauty salon that offers hair services to the homeless. Guess what I did? I did exactly that. Well, that's a really, really boring thing to read. I, I don't know if you could possibly imagine, but it's like, yep, I did what I said. <laughs> That's not useful to you, it's not useful to us. What we're interested in is a reflection on things that worked, things that didn't, kind of what you're up to. We're trying to get inside how, the, how this, this work works. Uh, and we want to be able to tell the stories of that effectively. Um, and so the whole assessment process, from the ethnographic interviews to the self-assessment, instead of interim and final reports, it's really a self-assessment process, is intended to get at those narratives in a more effective way. Um, so that's that's the assessment part of uh, <laughs> excuse me the services. And then we offer anything we can through our network. If you need, you know, somebody who does who does X, Y, or Z, um, we'll reach out to our board and see if anybody knows someone, which they usually do. I was just wondering about the scope of the project within it's, it's a year fellowship. And so does the project need to take the whole year? What if the major bulk of it is less than that? It can oh, be less than a year. Okay. Yeah. It can be less than a year, for sure. And it can be more than a year. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, that, that kind of brings me to another point. Um, the, the projects can be at any stage of, of the process. You can be at the very beginning, you can be in the middle of the project that takes place over time, you can be at the very end culminating the project. Any of that is okay. Um, the projects that tend to be received well by the selection committee are the ones that are far enough along that the committee can see what it is you're driving at. And so if you're so early in your research pro process that it's really amorphous, that's something to think about, because they need to be able to understand what you're doing, mm -hmm. right? You know, remember the, the whole thing about an outside audience looking at your work? They can't get inside your head and they don't understand your process because they don't know you as an individual, even though they're trying to through your website and your CV and stuff like that. Um, and so the, the key there is be sure that you're, you're in a place in your project where you can really clearly articulate what it is you're doing. Otherwise, wait till next year. We're not going anywhere. 
we're gonna. Pro I think we have to kind of wrap yeah, the, these wrap it. questions for now. If you have further questions, please feel free to shoot me an email. Um, at this point, we're gonna divide you guys. I think probably <laughs> right up the middle is the easy way to go with that. Um, what's going around? Everyone could identify. 
identify with the subject matter. Um, in that when she gave like five lines, or like, no, like five words, that made us be able to understand exactly in our own body, emotionally, how that connection was made. You know? Between, it was, so it wasn't a one-way connection. It wasn't just like, oh, I'm going to come and impart whatever onto you. It was, we're going to transform each other through this process. And I, as a reader, could feel that transformation happen just by reading her proposal. Not what the overall motivation of the last 20 years of your work is. Okay. 
very best of luck. I really hope you all apply. Really excited to see your proposals. Uh, and don't hesitate to email me at info at